Thank you. And good afternoon. This is a, a title that Mark came up with, and it's called Living in Danger Zone, obviously there. It's a, just a, one of many chapters in the ongoing saga of uh, Valerie and Mark Sigler. Mark and I go back quite a long time ago. You know, I was born here in Oakland, but moved to the Kansas City area back in about 63, just in time for JFK and the Beatles. And Mark and I fell into one another's company as we uh, entered uh, high school. And, really became very, very, very good friends right from the get-go, um, almost inseparable. We even had some time in Hollywood High School in our sophomore you know, year, and, but we actually found our way back into uh, the Kansas City area to, in order to graduate. Mark's uh, father owned a, a dental lab called Myron Dental Labs in Kansas City, and I oftentimes worked there with Mark and worked on teeth models. So uh, Mark eventually decided that he wanted to uh, joined his, his, his father to a certain extent uh, in the dental business, but eventually he cashed out and decided that he and Vel would move on down to the uh, Pensacola Beach area where they were going to live you know, off of uh, uh, his, his funds from having sold his uh, portion of his family uh, business to his brothers. So when they got down there, they learned very, very quickly though that you've got problems down there that you didn't have in Kansas. And uh, very, very quickly, uh, as they started to engage Mother Nature, they decided that it was time to either come up with a, a, a means of dealing with it or get out of town. So they approached FEMA, because FEMA had uh, been in the habit of constantly shelling out public funds to those who had lost their houses, conventional houses, time and time and time again. And in doing so, uh, the funds would go back into reconstructing the houses in their former conventional uh, manner, and that didn't seem to, to make much sense to Mark. So they actually got an approved loan uh, grant, as it was, uh, from FEMA, in the amount of $250,000, and he took this money, and he decided to put it to good use. Mark, using his background in terms of uh, fashioning and modeling uh, in a dental industry and applied it in an appropriate manner to something that he knew nothing about. He was not trained as an architect. He'd never built a home. And uh, he started to uh, engage those professionals that he needed to have in order to be able to make this thing work. So they wanted to build something that was gonna last. Most houses are conventional. You know, They give them a 50 year lifespan. Uh, but he said, why not try to do something for seven generations or so? So he came up with a notion self-imposed of 150 years. Got to be water resistant if you're living near the, the ocean, and that's you know what the hurricanes use to cause much of their damage beyond the wind. Uh, should involve a lot of cutting edge materials, and it should be beautiful. That's a subjective term, but they, they decided that they, they had some taste. So they explored various technologies, and they came up with the notion of the air form monolithic dome, which was done by the South down in Texas, and they found some uh, architect formerly of this area, Jonathan Zimmerman, he's no longer uh, alive, uh, rest his soul, and uh, Bob Bissett, who was assisted, assisted Jonathan in his endeavors with hobbit-like types of domes, which appealed to Mark because they looked aesthetic as opposed to industrialized storage containers or hemispheres that you see in the landscape. He knew that the dome was both hydro and aerodynamic, and that was the thing that really appealed to his, his, his sense of, uh, of uh, appropriateness. So biomimicry, just looking around, obviously there are seashells, there are any number of things that have smooth shape to them, which uh, have uh, evolved over time to resist various aspects of, of the physical environment. These are some of the pictures uh, that uh, you're familiar with, seashells and obviously you know, sea creatures. The professionals were assembled. We have the visionary Mark, not a professional. We have uh, his wife, Vel, who is the one who is in charge of maintaining the integrity of the, the budget uh, associated with the FEMA grant. We had the architect, Jonathan Zimmerman, who was actually the guy doing the serious sketches, uh, assisted ably by Bob Bissett. One of America's 100 best painters. He's been awarded as such. He was trained as an architect at uh, Washington U, summa cum laude, after having flown uh, in the Air Force in Vietnam. He did not want to be an architect, but he had no problem dealing uh, with Jonathan Zimmerman and the, the uh, challenges of the, uh, the aesthetic world. Dr. Arnold Wilson, uh, an esteemed expert with respect to thin shell form. The South fabricating the air form, and uh, this is what happened. 
You see on the upper left here, you see the uh, 16, 17 piles actually, of, of, uh, of piers that they used in order to claw this thing into the sand. The form uh, of the ring support machine in the lower left hand corner uh, and the balloon in an inflated capacity. Here is, is what it is before it's inflated. And then on the beach is the interior, as they're shooting the interior of the, the, uh, the balloon form with the polyurethane, attaching clips in order to be able to attach what turned out to be about five miles of rebar, and then the, the shot blasting, more like a, a shot crate, in order to be able to build up this, this composite. Insulation on the outside, mass on the interior, was served to be a very, very good heat sink with a very, very good tempering element. These are just some elements out of the South book on monolithic dome, which shows precisely what we've seen in C2. These are after the fact com computational analysis by Dr. Habib Sadid, formerly of the Idaho State University uh, Structural Department, wind tunnel analysis. That's the dome as it appeared in about 2004 in its finished capacity. You see the trees aren't even sprouting and they never really got a chance to, uh, to get any foliage because of the uh, activity. And there was a lot of activity that occurred, as we know, from 2000 onward, hurricane-wise. These are just some of the architectural sketch. It shows the first floor. The first floor was placed at 21 feet above sea level. That is so that the surge that would come from the hurricane would actually go under the house, bust away the garage doors, and allow the habitable, the first habitable le uh, level to be more or less isolated from the ravages of the storm. That small diagram to the right is the master bedroom area that's on top. We've got 120 tons of concrete on the first floor, 80 tons in the second, and the overall shell 180. So you can do the math, it's, it's, it's a lot of concrete. Entering off stage, we've got it. There's Ivan. Category four hurricane, wind speeds of 135 to 155. When it land fell, 135 miles per hour. So without further ado, we got a little clip from the Weather Channel here of the actual activity. You, you build something up, the storm tears it down, you build it back. The storm tears it down, you build it back. Frustrated by the cycle of destruction, Mark designs a home that he believes will withstand a hurricane. With Ivan making landfall, it is about to face its first test. They're being told to leave right now. The wind Meanwhile, Hurricane follows hurricanes. Sanders has come to Pensacola Beach to report on the storm for Fresh NBC. from Iraq. To encourage the residents who may have remained behind here on Pensacola Beach, they have shut the water off to this area so that anybody who's trying to take a shower or turn their water on will get the hint. There's no reason to remain behind. The word from New York, here's this house that can withstand a hurricane. I'm like, a house that can withstand a hurricane? So we go over there and we, we mark. And so Mark said, well, um, if you guys want to ride the hurricane out with us, we're on a barrier island. So it's a real roll of the dice, but we're kind of like, what do you think? Kind of look at all each other and go, okay, we'll ride it out there. By afternoon, the winds pick up to a howling 75 miles an hour. But inside the dome, the TV crew experiences a calm they never thought possible during a hurricane. We were doing pretty good, and then about 7 o'clock, one of the newsmen, he handed me his cell phone. He said, this calls for you. I said, hello? And the guy on the other end was the head weatherman down at the Hurricane Center in Miami. Can you understand that? And he said, you have to get those guys out of your house. You're all going to die in 70-foot waves. I thought, oh my god, I've killed myself with these newsmen on national TV. Then Mark gets a call from a panicked weatherman in Miami. He warns them that towering waves are on their way and urges Mark to evacuate before the dome home is destroyed. Well, I told him, I said, we can't go anywhere. They closed the bridge six hours ago. And he said, oh, no. At that point, I could hear the panic in his voice, and I did become pretty alarmed. He said, the storm surge at your house should top out between 20 and 25 feet. We've got 135 mile an hour winds outside. It's raining so hard sideways that you literally can't see more than three feet out that door. It's, it's absolutely amazing. We can literally hear huge chunks of other houses bouncing off of this house. Now, i got to say, this is something that I never expected, and that is that I'd be able to lay my head on a pillow 
and go to sleep. The surge was hitting the bottom of the first the level, knocking the granite free from the countertops. That's the Mark pounding. And the news crew get there we go. Look at the Houses picked up over pilings and moved. Kids on Christmas morning, you know, what's out there, what's out there. And as the sun came up more and more, and you could see the extent of the devastation, everybody just got rebuilt and quieter because when you really saw what happened outside, we realized how lucky we were to be alive. The beach houses that were built on the ground level were just gone. They were just wiped away. No sign they'd ever been there. The news crew records the first images of the destruction on Pensacola Beach. Now, the news team has to get their footage on the air. With roads impassable, it falls to producer A.J. Goodwin to walk through the wreckage to the mainland. Roads have disappeared under the sand. Remnants of houses litter A.J.'s path. The entire landscape has been ravaged. It was just all sort of washed around and washed away. There was a marina up there in the boat. The evening, her footage is broadcast, giving the nation its first look at the devastation of Pensacola Beach. Been to war zones. This was worse than a war zone. It was just flat. Mark Sigler's dome home survives, but his neighbors' homes have been swept out to sea. I realized at that time that it was going to take years for the beach to recover, although the dome did pretty good, the infrastructure. So, reconstruction. They knew it. They planned for it. Those stairs that you saw torn away were meant to tear away. The garage doors were meant to be blown away so that the water could move under the house. Just much as seashells at the bottom, you know, of a seafloor, water moves around without rolling them. Okay, so there was a lot of publicity. They had a website. They were getting 60,000 hits a month after the hurricane. Mark starts to respond to that. He says, what can we do? People are asking us, can we do this? Well, as you see here, Dr. Arnold Wilson put the house on the cover of his book, you know, which is the treatise on uh, practical design for thin shell concrete structures. And it made the 2003 IRC special publication for construction in the hurricane resistance zone. Still the code. These are some of the things we came up. This is a, called Skybird. This is a biomimicry sort of response to some inquiries from HGTV. They wanted to do a pilot and they wanted to feature what we were working on now, so we came up with this. Can we move on from this one? I think that we got the gist. We can just move on perhaps to the next uh, slide. Are we okay? All right. These are some of the ideas that we played with. This was a, a merge, three dome sort of a situation. We got a call from somebody who had a, a gaming facility in the hurricane zone, and he thought that perhaps a, a resort you know, could come out of this. These are just some of the views, some models that we worked with. Uh, we got another call from somebody up in the uh, uh, North Dakota region. They wanted to do an art, artist cultural center, and we came up with a the notion. They wanted to phase each one of these things, so we had independent domes. Uh, we even had this funny little thing, which was literally a, you know, <laughs> derivation of a bird. And so we had to deal with some of the concerns that you see here, economic, climate change, poverty, and population. These are things that are very, very pressing issues to us all. And so it more or less got us thinking in another direction. As you can see here, 
Um, one of the things that we, we came across was lost technologies. We noticed that there's a lot of concrete that's been around for 5,000 years. Well, what about that technology? What were they doing? They weren't doing it the way we do it today. Why is it lasting so long? There's a Dr. Joseph Davidovitz who's in uh, France who has actually reversed, analyzed uh, some of the concretes and he finds out it was agglomerated stone made with local uh, materials and aggregates. We're wondering why isn't that being used today? Uh, Ed Masria with this 2030 challenge has just been advised by the National Everrated Concrete uh, Association that they've agreed to take on the 2030 challenge and reduce the amount of CO2 in the production of concrete to 50% by the time we get to 2030. That's not 100% as he wants, but it's, it's, it's a move in the right direction. Um, we're thinking about employing you know, more appropriate sorts of uh, technology in areas where you, know, you don't necessarily need to fend off from a hurricane, but you do have a situation where if we can actually figure out a way, factory produced or even on site and using you know, uh, technologies we have available to us, obviously in seismic areas, these things are very, very stiff. We have, uh, in, in one design, uh, spring pilings that actually reduce the actual shaking from a seismic uh, uh, force, you know, uh, coupled with a rigid building. Generally, that's bad because it cracks, but we see that we've got so much in this. And then, so this is some of the stuff that you see in terms of smaller, tri-merged sorts of things that might be incorporated uh, elsewhere in the world to address the needs of, of, of housing, refugee housing. Um, and as you can see, it's a generative mode. Sustainability is key in our minds. That particular sort of village that you saw there has carports that have checkout cars that you can actually you know, log into your phone and reserve. Uh, you've got PV on the circulating uh, carports. It's another one where you just ganged a couple of things together. This is a nice slide that I saw that maybe I'll use in closing. This is from Dr. Adam Neiman. He's got the earth with the relative volume of water and the relative volume of atmosphere. Okay, we've got to take care of it. We've got to figure out ways to do it. We can do it. Thank you very much. We'll close with this. It's dramatic, it's daring, and it's downright disaster proof. And can feel like one of the biggest, baddest domes ever attempted. And laugh off. This bold bubble concept is called the Skybird. Once it's built, it will be 50% larger than the Sigler's Dome Home in Florida and pack a ton of amenities into its 8,000 square foot interior. Just like one heck of a forest hideaway. But if this forest aren't taking any chances, they're spending big bucks to build a dome home that they're sure can take a serious beating. End of the foundation so that earthquake seismic activity will reduce the. And in case the forest around it goes up in flames, this cupboard will come tricked out with fire resistant glass, a retardant exterior coating and even a cutting-edge smoke filtration system. When it comes to extreme designs, Mark Sigler is definitely a visionary, but he isn't an architect. So he called on an old friend who'll help make his Skybird concept a reality. Mark and Dante designed a dome home that pushes the envelope both inside and out. And I have dual master suites, uh, four additional bedrooms, a large commercial kitchen. Uh, it's going to have a huge garage area that's a multi-function area so that you can set it up any way you want. I mean, well, thought of everything. So all things considered, what kind of money are we talking here? This one's going to cost uh, probably one. When the Skybird soars in 2009, the Sigler's hope it will inspire a new generation of home builders to think outside the box. Our hope for these homes in 200 or 300 years, the way that the forest looks after it, it is closed in around this house, and this house has become part of the forest. Uh, you know, to me, that it. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity, okay? Um, these are some of the technologies that are available to us. Hempcrete, uh, geopolymer concrete, balsot, still reinforcing, extremely appropriate materials to be used. Um, thank you. <laughs>